Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am proud to have Tim DeFrancesco joining us today. And the reason we had Tim on is Tim was, for six years, the head strength coach for the Los Angeles Lakers. And during that time, he had such players under his tutelage, such as Kobe Bryant, Ron Artest, Pau Gasol, Steve Nash. So we talk about that. We talk about what it's like to work with these guys. We talk about, you know, is everyone professional? Is everyone, you know, in there doing what they got to do? How does he work with personal trainers, uh, the organization, and how they feel on certain things? We talk about recovery. We talk about Kobe's specific workout routine and, and his rest. The best part of being with the Lakers, the worst part about being with the Lakers, his favorite lifts. Uh, ways he's changed his mind on nutrition and lifting in the past 10 years, and much, much more. So this is a great episode. Really important for you to listen to if you're a uh, high school or college basketball player or a parent. And there's a way at the end of the podcast to actually take advantage of what Tim is offering right now. So thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe so you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Corey. I'm pumped to be here. Yeah, good to see you again after all these months. And um, you were the Lakers' head strength coach for six seasons. And my first question for you is. What's the big takeaway that you walked away with after six years with an organization like the Lakers? Yeah, I think big takeaway there was the what a lot of people from the outside looking in probably don't realize is the common denominator between the Kobe's, Pau Gasol's, Meta World Peace, Ron Artest, uh, Steve Nash's that I got to work with, and what was the thing that they all had that certain players that don't need to create a list here, but that had similar athletic capabilities or similar abilities uh, of, of technical skill, but weren't able to kind of achieve the levels for the time and, and duration that, that those really hall of famers were able to do it was came down to, simply their willingness to be open-minded and have a growth mindset to look around them and, and see everything as a potential resource that they wanted to learn more about. So players can sometimes get to the level of the NBA or get to any new level that they've advanced to. And, and I think not just players, this happens in any workforce in any field, but feel like, well, I kind of got this figured out, right? I mean, I got this pretty darn high level that I just got to. And I pretty much at this point, if I just stick to what got me here, I'll be good. And that's fine. They might very well be able to stick there, but they're probably not going to expand and grow and, and have this trajectory that you see players go on that finish their career in the Hall of Fame where they had to start somewhere. They were just rookies who couldn't figure it out one once upon a time too. And... um you know, Steve Nash tells the story all the time is like he's in there with Dirk Nowitzki when they were both drafted by the Mavericks. And Dirk was like, dude, what the what the F are we doing here? Like, w- w- are we are we going to be able to do this at this level? Right. And so people forget two time MVP Steve Nash going for the Hall of Fame assists you know, top, you know, assist, assist guy and, and will always go down as one of the best uh, passers in the game and all this stuff. But he was sitting there with Dirk and looking at each other like, what are we, how are we going to be able to, you know, hack it, right? And, and, and Nash always says, like, I responded to Dirk like, yeah, hell yeah, we are. I mean, we may not have it figured out right now, but we're going to figure it out. But that's like that growth mindset that they all just had is like, yeah, so what if I don't have it figured out? And guess what? I'm going to be looking at every single thing and person around me as a potential resource to help me grow. And when you don't have that, you might be able to get there and hopefully stay there, but you probably won't be able to grow there. Interesting. When you first got hired and you walked in that first day, like how long did it take for you to gain their trust? Case by case basis. I would say somebody like Kobe is going to make you really earn that. Um, 
he's somebody and rightfully so. I mean, he can't just let everybody come in and, and so many people want to come in and, and be somebody that adds value to him because that adds value to them. If that's the, what, what ends up getting, you know, played out, but not everybody can bring value to somebody like Kobe. That's the reality, or at least from his perspective. And, and certainly he's, he's the ultimate judge and call on that. And so, you know, I think somebody like Steve Nash, Meta World Peace, they were a lot more willing and, and able to let me just say, and I really appreciated how much they were looking at a rookie in me. I was a rookie to the NBA. I was a rookie to being a head strength coach. So they could have easily just said, look, I mean, I'm kind of pretty far down the road here. I've got my stuff figured out. I'm sure you're a nice guy. I'm sure you've got some nice stuff in your tool belt, but I'm, I, I really – you know, I'm not interested in taking pro tips from the guy who just walked in the door. So they, they open our, they, they, those two especially were, were so immediately willing to just kind of say, well, what do you got? Let's, let's talk about it. I want to learn from you. I think Kobe over time understood my work ethic and my approach and then realized I had some chops and some good knowledge base and, and creative ways of, of approaching the craft of strength and conditioning, but he definitely made me earn it. So it, it is a uh, case by case basis with each person. I think the biggest key to that going well and as fast as it can go with any individual is just being yourself. Um, a lot of times people in the role that I had will try to, you know, be more than they are and, and, and try to impress people and try to go a little bit outside of their scope and, get get ahead of themselves and um i think especially players at that level they can smell that a mile away and uh and they don't really appreciate that so it's just like let it take its time like take take its course if you're enjoyable to be around you you will sh you show that you're highly dependable you show that you uh are there to help them and and listen to them and you're there for them first as a human and second as a player then over time you, you can gain anybody's trust did these guys all have their own trainers, Tim? A lot did, right? I mean, I, we had Dwight Howard come in. Dwight was allowed even to bring his own strength coach in the weight room with him. Uh, before I got there, Kobe had Tim Gro Grover. Uh, Tim and I actually developed a good relationship together, and then eventually I took the baton and the torch um, from Tim. But uh, up and down the list, even Steve Nash, uh, he, he had worked for years and, and, and was extremely co close with the director of performance and medical with the Golden State Warriors now, Rick Celebrini. So, I mean, I got a chance to be around all those people. Typically, what when that worked out really well is from my end, not looking at it as, <clears throat> you know, that's that's somebody that's a threat or taking from my job, but that it's my job in that role to basically be the liaison between the player and their person that they have already put in place for themselves and how we can all work together. Look, that's easier said than done because in my role, I'm also sitting there while I was in that role and, and trying to say, I just, you know, like anybody want to make sure I prove my worth too. So, you know, it, it can be, it could be really tricky, but as um, you have to be able to check your ego at the door and just say what's best for the player and then um, develop a relationship with the player where you could be honest and open and work together. Yeah. Cause if I'm the Lakers organization. I'm hiring you to implement the mission, but then you've got these other guys that have their own trainers that might be saying something different that's got to be a tricky situation for, for management too, right? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely makes the, makes things really murky at the NBA level because there is so much of that. It used to be, it used to be like, unless you're a Kobe level player, you're, you're probably not going to have your own person. Now the, the, the 11th guy on the bench has their own person. And so it makes it really murky. It makes it a much harder job to do as the head strength coach because it's, I think it was Bill Parcells who has that famous saying about, well, what I want to do with the football team is I want to, I want to buy the groceries and I want to go make the meal. But if I don't get to buy my groceries, then somebody else is buying the wrong groceries. I'm not going to sit here and make the meal with groceries somebody else bought. Right. And that's yep. the same idea 
of <clears throat> how am I supposed to go upstairs and tell the general manager, well, it's not really, we're not making the progress we wanted or so-and-so is getting injured all the time, but I don't know what you want me to do. Cause I'm not buying the groceries that he's using for his strength workout. Right. So, um, it, it, it makes it really hard. Uh, luckily I had Mitch Kupchak to, you know, be on the, the reporting side to of somebody that is highly uh, knowledgeable and aware of what the score is, so to speak of, of how things are going. So he knew he could only hold me accountable to certain extents and uh, certainly did hold me accountable to what he could and what I could control, but also knew that that landscape uh, is the wild, wild west. And, and when you start putting people in there that are buying the groceries that we wouldn't have bought if, if we had our, uh, he, you know, our, our druthers, then, um, it, it, you know, he understood all that. So luckily I had that. Back to Kobe Bryant, because obviously one of the goats of all time, you mentioned he had a growth mindset, but I've heard about him working out three times a day in the summer, working out after games, working at four in the morning. And that sounds great. You're getting reps in, but we also know a lot more about recovery now. What was his recovery like and what were your thoughts on that? Or was that even a thing back in those days as much as it is now? It was starting to be. It's a really good point by you. And and yeah, he definitely burned it down. I mean, he definitely, one of his calling cards and his signatures to being able to dominate the way he did for so long was he, he just used the preparation as his his confidence so his confidence came from his preparation and he knew he always had more preparation under his belt than any other person pretty much and um he used that to his advantage i mean he he just i can remember him saying to me when he's coming back from his achilles rehab that he had it had been over almost a year since he had been able to play any level of competitive basketball and yet he was in his mind and what he would say to me is I would say, how's it, how's it feeling today? How's everything? He said, I feel amazing. I feel like I could score 81 points every single night if I stepped out there right now, you know? And so I think those are the, because he knew he was putting more rehab reps. He knew he was putting in, he had accumulated at that point in his life, way more reps with the basketball than any other person probably in the NBA. And so I think for him, that was kind of, the 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 big differentiator and he definitely did i mean there's classic story i told a lot about how we lost a game in memphis and then had to travel sh to chicago which means we might get in the air at midnight from memphis and fly to chicago and might get to our hotel by one you know by 2 2 a.m and and then we got to check bags get to our room so it's like three four o'clock in the morning and i get up to my room finally and I get a text from him. What are you doing? And I'm um, thinking in my head, what am I doing? I'm about to pass out right here. I don't even know if I'm going to make it to brush my teeth and, and uh, get my clothes off here, but I'm going to hit this bed. Obviously I didn't say that to him. I said, uh, nothing. I'm what do you need? And how can I help? And uh, he was like, I want to work out right now. So go down, take the elevator. I hear this classical music Mozart going in the uh, background of the lobby. And I'm thinking, why do they have somebody sitting here playing on the piano this time of day? And of course it was him waiting for me just doing a riff on the piano. And, uh, and then we all off, we went to, to work out at four thirty in the morning in Chicago. And that was actually a back-to-back -back away game. So we played that day. So we were, we were going to be playing in a couple hours basically. And so, um, yeah, those are all true. All that stuff is true. He used to tell me that is why I did that. I, I would, those stories about he'd work out 6 a.m. at noon and then again at 6 p.m. And he just said, look, by noon every day, I already had two more workouts than most people had. And I was just putting not just pennies. I was putting hundred dollar bills in my bank of confidence. <laughs> and, and, and of course you reap the benefits of the reps you're taking, but it is a, a, a to him, it was more of a, uh, a way to get the edge mentally, I, I think in that confidence side. And so coming all the way back to your question though, <clears throat> the recovery uh, emphasis that we see now and, and an awareness and understanding and how much we know uh, how important it is ha, ha, was just starting to come around. And, and yet he was very aware of that. And so I think that late in his career, he knew that he couldn't 
uh, cheat the system and, and, and get away with some of the stuff he could have got away with probably when he was in his twenties, but he would have me literally identify before we got to a city. He, he latched onto and felt like this one brand of cold tub was the best brand out there. And he, you know, demanded that I have that, uh, a location prepared that had that brand of, of cold tub uh, I located and ready to go, reached out to them and had, you know, our arrival time prepared so that as soon as we hit a new city, we would get in a private car while the rest of the team went to the hotel and we would just head straight for that. I mean, sometimes we would go an hour out of the city and we would pass dozens of places where we could get a cold tub to get to the one that he felt was like the best of the best. And he was probably right about that. But at the you know, the other side of it, I'm always thinking like, I mean, isn't a cold tub, a cold tub. <laughs> and, and, uh, it, but you know, for him, that, that was, that was a way to get an edge and he was always going to be stacking those things. And I think that was really all that mental game. He was always uh, playing chess when others were playing checkers. Back in when you were in the NBA, your last year was what 2016? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, two that uh, two thousand. I was there from 2011 to 2017. Yep. Okay. Was sauna and cold plunging was that a thing in recovery and training? Much at that point at your level or not? It was. It was definitely at that level. Um, okay. You know, teams had cryo chambers. Teams certainly had some cold plunge access beginning to be put in. I would say like the infrared sauna stuff has come, you know, since then uh, you did, definitely didn't see as much of that. The stuff like float tanks that you see now um, that, that stuff had, had just come onto the scene and, uh, and, and I wouldn't, you know, necessarily say that those things were entering into team facilities the way they are now, but they were definitely, um, uh, definitely on the, uh, forefront of the minds of a lot of those more progressive players where where do you stand on float tanks because i know steph curry does it i i did it for years when i lived in dc um i thought it was great at getting the theta waves going calming down getting that magnesium and with these guys having so much pressure so many people coming at them all the time i think it makes sense but what are your thoughts and are more people doing it just besides steph nowadays oh i love it i i actually absolutely love it i mean the, the thing that you have to think about, though, is it's not going to it may not be the thing for every person. So it's it's more of a the other the other the flip side of this. What I'm about to say is the fact you could look at it another way. So looking at it from the reverse would be. Cold plunges, right? It's kind of the craze right now. Everybody's locked into it, even Gen Pop and the, the CrossFit or the primal uh, audiences are all doing the cold, cold plunges. Right. So. Used to be, look, I, I went to undergrad in uh, the like early 2000s. And even even then you had the athletic training room at a small division three school that I went to had a had a cold tub in there and or had a had an, a, a, a metal bucket that you would fill with water and and uh, put put ice in there. So the ice baths that have now turned into cold plunges, essentially the same thing, but those have been around for a long time, but then I think what we assumed was because there is research and evidence to say it can help with soreness and recovery, that kind of thing, everybody should be doing it. But here's an interesting take. What if cold plunging or ice baths actually increases a person's stress because they just really are hypersensitive to cold and that kind of thing? Could we actually be doing literally the reverse of stimulating recovery for this person by force feeding them this modality this this option so obviously float tank is not abrasive or you know it's 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 something that is pretty comfy for anybody and i don't think you have that in in um to worry about other than the fact that for some people if 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 you're not great with enclosed spaces i don't think that that person gets into a really level of deep relaxation using float tank if they're sitting there like i don't really love this right now (laughs) you know so um, I think for the right person, either or in, in those two uh, options of, of recovery strategies can be phenomenal. It's just a matter of um, like from an exercise prescription standpoint, there's many great exercises out there. It doesn't mean all those great exercises are great for every person. Right. Right. Um, 
without mentioning names, when you were at the NBA, did you come across players who were physically gifted and just didn't have to work as hard? Without a doubt. I mean, I would say majority. <laughs> you know, that's that's the reality. Like, I mean, there's a there's a probably I always broke down every locker room to into basically four parts. You have 30 percent of the locker room who are the person that's going to work the hardest. They're going to sit in the front of the room. They're going to soak up everything around them. They're going to be there first, leave last. They're going to um, uh, be into whatever potential things that myself or another staff person could provide for them. <clears throat> They're going to be all in, right? They're going to do everything they can and get the most out of the opportunity. You have 30% who are going to basically show up. They're going to do uh, everything that's been asked of them. They're going to never rock the boat. They're never going to uh, be an issue. They're going to always make sure all their boxes are checked and, and they're doing <clears throat> all their stuff and, and, and they're showing up and they're, they're being engaged while they're there. You're going to have 30% who, you know, most days they're, they're, they're there. Uh, you know, they're, 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 pretty well locked in some days every once in a while they kind of mail it in a little bit they coast a little bit but they they aren't outwardly uh pulling the dragging the team down and and uh might get caught up in some of the wrong habits once in a while but you know they they keep and then you're gonna have 10 percent who just don't give an f you know and it's like that's honestly pretty much society right and not just a locker room not just a it's just the locker room is no different than how we're broken up in society and how people are and at any workplace and, and that kind of thing. We just assume that, well, because it's the NBA, it's millions of dollars guaranteed and these players must all just love the game and they must all be the type A personalities who are, you know, all going to fight each other to get to the front of the room to sit first and, you know, be the first one on the bus and be the last one at the practice facility, all that stuff not the case. And so I think you only got about 30, you know, 30% of those, uh, you know, people that, that those players that that's really true about. And then everybody else falls into one of the other three categories. Thanks for breaking that down. I never thought of that before, but that, that makes a lot of sense to him. Yeah. Um, your job in the weight room in the NBA, was it more about gaining strength or injury prevention? <laughs> Absolutely. The, um, the ability that I could help them the most with and that I always made my point of emphasis was availability. And so, uh, you know, that's the durability, right? And so um, the, that was the ability that I always made the point of emphasis from, from my end, availability and durability. And um, look, they don't need to necessarily oftentimes be able to run faster, jump stronger. They need to be able to, you know, one example is what goes up has to come down. So am I preparing them more for their landings than I am for their jumps? Um, am I preparing them to build uh, the resilience physically out there that it takes to withstand the, the rigors of the game? Am I getting them out there to address his historical injuries and make sure that we're making sure that th those things don't come out of nowhere again? Uh, getting physically stronger sure i mean that was a, an objective with plenty of players i worked with but it was never the first objective and um some more than others i mean you might have a brandon ingram who came in like a stick man and it, you know he he uh you better hope he he doesn't take a shirt off you might lose track of him i mean if he turns sideways right and so you know getting a guy like that though I think this is where sometimes strength coaches can go wrong is, and sometimes it's not the strength coach. Sometimes it's the, the, the general manager, it's the upstairs people or the coaches. They're like, we got to get some meat on his bones and we got to get him, you know, to, to, to have bulletproof layers that we can see and all this other stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, but his frame all this point of time has been based on him being 205 pounds. You want me to get him to 225? And he's still going to be out there jumping and running and doing all the stuff with the, the, you know, now up to two to four times as much force going through there because his weight increased by 20 pounds. You know, you could have that up, up to, you know, you could add a tremendous amount more force through his 
long bones of his free feet, the long bones of his lower leg and, and those types of things where we see a lot of injuries happen. And sometimes it is because they're just not uh, prepared for the, the amount of work that comes at them in the NBA and, and the, the length of season is so much longer than the college season or the, the certainly the high school season. But also sometimes it's because we just put on a bunch of, yeah, muscle on this person, but that really changes what happens to their body below. So um, it's not always the right answer to think about. We got to get the, the, some, some uh, layers of, of muscle on this person. It's like, how, how functional is that? And how much is enough? Yeah. Good point. Really good point. What was the best part of working with the Lakers and what was the worst part? Great question. I would say one of the best parts was just relationships with the players, getting to know players, being in the trenches. Uh, Yeah, it's like a grind when you've got to get off of a road trip and either get home to L.A. at the time and, and, and get to your house or apartment by by 3 a.m. off of a long road trip but then wake up and go to the practice facility for 8 a.m. the next morning and kind of you're all in it together there's something that it's certainly a grind and it's a lot but it's really uh you know kind of a i would say a, a special place to be when you're in that trench and you're you're having to be there with the player that rolled his ankle and has to show up first for a training room and um you're, you're sort of, uh, you're able to kind of be in the, in the same, uh, boat with them with everything. And, and so you develop really close relationships with those people, not just players, but the people. And that, that, that's certainly one of the best parts that I think back to often. And for me, I tell people all the time, the worst part was the travel. I mean, the travel will just, it'll whittle you down. And, uh, it, 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 it gets you. I, I used to just be fascinated at how these players, I wasn't obviously playing a single minute of NBA basketball, but I was exhausted constantly. And I just marveled at how they could roll the ball out there every day and have a tough practice or, or play a, a tough game, go into overtime, go play a back to back and go through these time zones that the rate that we were, it just is like, Man, the word, the, the, you know, you're in the dog days of the season when you, you hear your phone alarm go off and you roll over and you start reaching for stationary on the desk at the, in, in the hotel bed that you're in, you start reaching for the stationary to, to, to see what's the address on the stationary to see what city you're even in. Um, and, uh, that's when, you know, and, and that would, that would happen, you know, that would happen. But, uh, you know, so that, that, that was tough, really tough. During your time there, were there guys who weren't superstars that really impressed you with their professionalism and work ethic? Oh yeah. Ryan Kelly is a guy who he played at Duke and he's, I think still playing overseas now, maybe in Japan, but, um, that's a guy who just, he got, way more out of his potential, like out of himself than even he probably should have because he just, he just dotted all his I's and crossed all his T's. He was the first one in, he was getting extra work. He was, he, he, he took the recovery stuff series seriously. He took the strength training stuff seriously. It was like, he just wanted to know what he should be signing up for, what, what he should be doing next. But if you told him he would do it. And so, and he would, you know, do extra. And so there's a, there's a player who easily could have been just a training camp guy in his rookie year uh, or, or just finished his NBA career in his first uh, summer league, but found a place for himself. And um, uh, even though now, you know, he's in Japan, he, he made a career out of the game for himself because of his work ethic, his habits. And, um, you know, most people aren't necessarily thinking back to Ryan Kelly as, as a name that really stands out, but he, he deserves it. Nice. I haven't heard that name in a long time. So that's a blast right. in the past right there. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the past 10 years, like what have you changed your mind on when it comes to training basketball players? I would say, you know, the, the, I think the biggest thing is uh, volume of, 
work probably from my end. So I think there's a less is more approach that I take uh, more now than I certainly ever did. I can remember sitting down to try to lay out my very first ever comprehensive basketball strength training program, which at the time I was working with some couple players who were trying to make it into the ABA at the time when the ABA, not the, not the Dr. J ABA, but the, the ABA of like the mid two thousands when they were trying to still operate. And it was, um, it was minor league basketball, but it was, uh, I don't even know if that's a fair way to put it, but, uh, <clears throat> man, I had those guys doing, uh, everything. I mean, every, every single training mo- modality there was ladder agility drills. I had them doing uh, body weight training, band training. I had them doing free weights. I had them doing Olympic lifts. I had them doing uh, plyos. I had them doing track workouts. It's like, look, you gotta, just, you can't do it all and you can't do right. all of everything and you got to narrow it down. Um, you got to understand that. For a basketball player, the lower body is king in terms of the durability of the lower body. That is king. If you can't help a basketball player be durable in their lower body, they're they're probably going to get injured. And and um, they may get injured anyways. But it, there's some things out of our control. They fall on an ankle. They you know, a guy runs into them and and takes out their knee and and fall. Things happen. But <clears throat> I think. That's the piece for me is the amount of work that I feel like now is 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 just enough to keep them durable and and able to do the thing they love versus before I felt like I had to I had to build the basketball player. It's like no no I I have to create durability in this basketball player that is already in front of me. Yeah, and what's a jumping on top of that? What's a common training mistake basketball players make? I think the biggest mistake that they make is um, is, is probably, uh, skipping leg day. If I'm being honest with you, I think a lot of hoopers and, and, and the other side of it is too, there's still that myth out there that if I get too uh, much upper body work, it's going to change my shot. Right. So one of those two things is, is, is often, um, a, a mistake. And I think skip leg day or avoid upper body stuff because you feel like it's going to change your shot. Uh, look, Ray Allen used to tr- travel with $50, 50 pound dumbbells. And so he could do them in the hotel and he could do them anywhere, but best shooters out there. I saw Steve Nash, you know, do trap bar deadlifts and do all kinds of chin ups and all this other stuff. And I mean, some of the best shooters out there and, 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 um, I mean, Kobe would lift hard and heavy and, uh, pretty good shooter right there. But, um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of, I think those are big errors. I think a lot of times players make the mistake of, here's one you won't expect me to say. I think sometimes players make the mistake of uh, trading too much time in the weight room for their skill development. So there's a, a fine line between you saying, like, I'm just going to get so physically ready for the game and you're trading now hours of time to just get better at the game. Yeah. Look, if, if you can't three times a week get 45 good minutes in the weight room and be doing the right stuff and know what you're doing and get the most out of it from a durability and strength standpoint, I mean, and, and then save the rest for the skill stuff, I think you're going to be in a position where at the end of an off season you're like, dang, I just kind of probably spent a little <clears throat> bit too much time in the weight room and I, I didn't get as many shots as I should have got or whatever the skill area is that you need to be working on. How about in the past 10 years, what have you changed your mind on as, as far as nutrition goes? I would say <clears throat> with that piece, it's um, sort of an ever uh, uh, changing landscape as we learn more and more about the, uh, the, how the body and, and food work together. But I would say the, the piece there is just most from a basketball specific standpoint, most players just aren't getting enough calories. So my take, and I probably for me, I got too far into the, the, the pebbles and sand of the, 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 the weeds of the um, topic and, and got carried away with stuff there more so than just saying, wait a minute, before we get way down into those little nitty gritty nuances and details, are we even getting enough calories period end of story and um, 
I just think most basketball players are not. And so their energy reserves are not what they should be. Their ability to maintain the weight that they should be at or they want to be at is, is, is very hard um, to do. And they, they end up by the end of the season, 10 pounds under what they started at um, stuff like that. So I, I think it's just looking at it more globally, more simply. Are there supplements you recommend to like high school and college players at all? Yeah, I would say most basketball players probably do need to take away protein. I don't think a creatine is a bad idea for most. Um, there's uh, still to this day, even though creatine is probably one of the most researched supplement out there, there's the myth that it can dehydrate you or make you uh, bulky. And, and uh, really creatine is more or less should be looked at. Creatine should be looked at more as just your ability to recover for the next day. Um, and it's a naturally occurring um, substance in, in, in uh, various animal proteins and things like that. So it's not, <clears throat> it's something that could be good, but I, I would just say those, those being some of the tops, if we wanted to get more detailed, I think not just basketball players, many people are deficient in either vitamin D, magnesium, some of those other um, vitamins, minerals that are really important for bone health. So uh, from a basketball player standpoint, some of those lower leg bone injuries, maybe something to keep in mind like that. But I think, you know, for the most part, it's like whey protein would be where I would start and finish with a lot of people. Gotcha. We're going to do some quick hitters. All right. Let's do it. What's your favorite lift? personally so two two i'm gonna i'm gonna cheat here and i'm gonna put out two so i think a trap bar deadlift <clears throat> is is like king if you have access to a trap bar uh so much bang for your buck from the loading of the spine the core the hips the hamstrings that posterior chain it's just great for building that durability and strength of, of total body really um but a sled push, like if you have a, access to a sled and a turf and you can push a sled uh, as part of your regular uh, action and routine, it, it is so much bang for your buck on that. You're loading the long bones, bones of your arms, your shoulders get strengthening from that because of the positioning. Your core has to stay really engaged because your core is the only hope for your lower body to be able to push that heavy sled forward. Um, it, your, your hips and your it, it, training, the, the sprint mechanics and the ability to develop strength and speed and running. Um, it just you help. You can use it for even endurance or cardio if you do it in, in a certain application. And so uh, those are the two. Those are that's, that's that's what I'm going with. Who's your favorite Laker that you worked with? If you can even say that. Wow. Oh man. Um, that's a you tough know, one. I'm sorry. On that's that, a tough one. No, I, I can, I can get there. Meta world peace will probably always go down as one of my favorites because he just was so open and curious and excited to, to try different things that maybe he hadn't been exposed to at that point in his career. And he, he was pretty far down the path in his career. Um, just a really genuine, caring person and somebody that, uh, I've stayed in touch with and, and uh, ha, ha, will always cherish the, the connection and relationship that we were able to develop in the trenches. The coolest celebrity interaction you had in L.A.? <laughs> so I tore my, my own Achilles playing uh, full court 21, um, one on one on one with Adam Levine. So oh, that geez. was from Maroon 5. So that was... Uh, that was definitely pretty uh, crazy. I also, uh, he, he, he was great. He helped me, uh, you know, make it to the hospital that day and, and uh, get, get uh, he, he uh, checked in on me for the rest of the season after that. But uh, <clears throat> one day I was driving to uh, Newport uh, Beach where um, Kobe lived to get him a workout. And um, my wife was in the passenger seat and, and uh, I got a text came into the phone and, and she was looking at the phone. She, she picked up the phone and was like, it looks like, uh, well, Kobe just sent a message that says uh, Kanye is going to be at the workout today. And uh, I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, Kanye who? And I'm like, Kanye, Kanye, it's, it's Kobe. Who do you, what Kanye do you think is going to be hanging out with Kobe? So sure enough, Kanye was at that workout and uh, he wanted the Kobe experience. And uh, man, uh, 
Kanye sure is a polarizing fellow at these stages uh, in the game. So we won't get into it right there, but um, that was an interesting one. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. No, Kanye Smith is going to be there, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, man. I uh, go back and forth between the movie Rudy and uh, Gladiator. So okay. if I uh, could only watch two movies from here on out, I could watch those just about any day of the week. Okay. And last one, Tim, before we get you out of here, uh, what are your hobbies when you're not doing your work? That, uh, let's see. Um, I love, I absolutely love, love, love cooking. I mean, oh, okay. I am not into baking because I don't, uh, you know, appreciate the fact that it's very, very, uh, I like to be able to kind of go with the flow and, and it, it, baking is too precise for me, but, um, Cooking is actually very, very relaxing for me. I, I love uh, eating good food. I love cooking good food. I love being around food with, with good people. And um, I would say that's, uh, that's, that's right up there for me. Okay. And then you have your own podcast on the basketball world. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, the Basketball Strong Podcast. So uh, my co-host and I, Phil White, we have uh, put over 100 episodes out there. and. Um, getting ready for a season three at, at, at some point in the next um, several months here and really excited about it. It's really opportunity for us to talk to not only uh, clinicians or strength professionals in the basketball space, but also players and coaches about what it takes to be basketball strong. And sometimes that is the physical preparation, but also uh, we have to take into account the, um, the, the other side of it and, and, and what it takes to be resilient in the process of a, a guy like Tim Frazier, who, um, you know, got told no and got cut from, I think eight or nine NBA teams before he got his first NBA contract. And, um, what, what it takes to kind of hear no like that, but keep going back for more and keep putting it together and believing in yourself. And so, um, it, it, there's a episode series we did with a guy, Jelani Williams, who, um, Jelani played at Penn and, um, I believe Howard after that. And, and, uh, he went basically four straight years without playing a basketball game from his senior year in high school to his senior year in college, because, he tore and retore his ACL three times. And so the, the depths and the places you go to uh, when you, when you go through something like that and how you come out the other side stronger, like he did, we try to capture that alongside that clinical side, the physical preparation side, the strength side. And so it's a, it's been a, a great journey, the basketball strong podcast. And um, it's uh, it's been a blast to do it with Phil. Great. And Phil lives two miles that way. And that's how we got connected. Exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. Our uh, the whole reason why we're we're here uh, trading our stories today. So uh, it's a it's a it's a perfect triangle. Small world. Yeah. Okay. And lastly, where can people find you, Tim? Yeah. So for me, um, best place is uh, quickest. Probably best place is Instagram at TD Athletes Edge, and um, our website at TD Athletes Edge is www tdathletesedge.com so those are two really easy places to find me we're we're spread out in a couple different other places but um those are probably two two of the best places to find us perfect we'll put those in the show notes at the end of this show tim thanks so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge of working in the nba uh you know weight room and, and sharing your experiences because i think our audience is always looking for that edge everyone in my audience let's put it this way everyone in my clients that reaches out to me potential clients wants to play in the nba it's right. a big goal. It should be. It's the, it's, the, it's the top of the mountain, right? But it's so hard to get to. We've been talking to experts the past you know, 90 some episodes on this podcast who've worked with NBA players trying to crack that code on how they get there. So I think you telling background on how these guys do it, both nutritionally, recovery wise, um, mentality, growth mindset, I think is just valuable. So thanks so much for sharing that today. No, Corey, it's great stuff. I, I love what you're doing and, and you're so right. And uh, you know, from my end, uh, really excited about what we have to offer for anybody that's looking to kind of try to crack that code of the physical side from our basketball strong 
uh, strength program that we we offer, and that is a um, for ninety nine dollars on that you get a for life you get a a twelve week basketball strength and conditioning program. That's great for somebody who's trying to know where to start in the weight room and get get themselves physically prepared for the weight room and and uh, from a basketball specific standpoint and. And um, I also offer customized online training for individuals that may have gone through some injuries or trying to get back to the court. How do we do that? My background as both a physical therapist and a strength coach, kind of putting that together and being your own personal po- co-pilot in the process of um, strength and conditioning and doing that from anywhere. So I have people and, and players uh, who live in Iowa and California and Australia, wherever they may be. And um would never be able to step foot in our facility here outside of Boston, Massachusetts, but um, can deliver to them a really uh, customized program and, and work that way as well. So again, reach out on any of those platforms and, and touch base with me, DM me on Instagram, or just check in on the website, www.tdathletesedge.com. Would love to help. Yeah. And just to piggyback on that, my trainer for the past year and a half has been virtual. So we talk once a month uh, on zoom he sent me. He sends me four workouts a week, and um, if you got a good baseline of what to do, like it's a great, it's a great way. So absolutely, if you're interested in that for a basketball player, you got one of the best there. You can take advantage of in Tim. So take advantage of that. Thanks for tuning in this week. I appreciate it. If you like what you hear, uh, be sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. Go to YouTube. We got a lot of good bonus content on there. And as always, go to prepathletics.com. You can reach out to me there if you got any questions and sign up for the newsletter. Until next time, we'll see you again. Thanks so much for tuning in.